Hi, this is Ian Gillen from Deep Purple. You're watching Loudwire. Hey everyone, Graham from Loudwire here, and it's Wikipedia Fact and Friction time with Mr. Ian Gillen of Deep Purple. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate it. I know you don't like Wikipedia very much. I, I have no feelings one way or the other. Oh, come Wikipedia. on. Wikipedia. You said that you avoid it on purpose. Well, I do in in the sense, not in the sense that I hate it or I've got no feeling for it, but it's just a complete waste of time. <laughs> it's a waste of my time. It, I know it's fallacious. I know, yeah. I know that they're, they're careless. I know there's been no research done at all. We're now on the third edition and update of my autobiography. Sure. First edition was over 20 years ago. I couldn't give a monkey's toss. All the information is there, um, and the real stuff. So um, I've consciously avoided um, actually reading anything about Wikipedia. All right. Well, we'll see if the people who read the book wrote Wikipedia. Could be. First <laughs> of all, it said you were born in Chiswick, London. That's true. That's true. Okay. They Chiswick, actually. Wrong. No, I was born in Chiswick. Chiswick? Yeah, it's Is called, that how you pronounce it? It's properly? pronounced Chiswick, yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. <coughs> That's all right. All right. Uh, it says you attended Acton County Grammar School. For three weeks at the end of my... After I got thrown out from my school, I spent my whole life at, yeah. That's it. Uh, where you were in the same class as Pete Townsend. No. No? No. Oh, okay. Uh, but you became distracted from studies after leaving a local cinema, having watched an Elvis Presley film, deciding you wanted to be a rock and roll singer. No, not really. I mean, no? no. The real truth of the matter is that seeing the Elvis film, I wanted to be a film star. Really? Yes. Okay. I was an impressionable teenager. I was already a singer. I'd been singing all my life. My granddad was an opera singer. My uncle was a jazz pianist. See, this stuff's really interesting, isn't it? I think um, so. My grandmother was a ballet tutor, so the house was full of music. I was a boy soprano in the church choir. And uh, it's true, I saw Elvis, but it wasn't until a little later that I thought of being a singer. It said you had at one time been approached by Nick Simper when Deep Purple was first forming, but you told him that the project would not go anywhere while you felt that your band Episode 6 was poised to make it big. No, that's not true. No, false. I knew Nick Simper and I knew Mick Underwood. I mean, everyone was hung around West London area, so everyone knew what was going on. And that sort of thing, but I wasn't invited to join the band, that's for sure. Concerto for group and orchestra with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Yourself, along with Blackmore, were initially unhappy at having to perform the concerto. Yes. That's true. Okay, why was that? Well, it was... We were focusing on this extreme rock and roll that we were writing and working on. Yes. And this came out... It wasn't that we didn't want to do it. It was just that it was at the wrong time. It was the managers that forced that situation. We felt it should have come after Deep Purple in Rock came out. Yeah. Because we felt that that was more about the band than the concerto was. And so that sowed a huge amount of confusion in everybody's mind that um, this thing came out first. That's why we were unhappy. Uh, were you happy with the result of it? Not really. Oh. It wasn't until... 99, when we did it again with the London Symphony Orchestra at the same venue, the Royal Albert Hall, that I realised what a piece of genius work it was. And when I suddenly analysed the construction and the story of this conflict between a traditional orchestra and a young rock band, which was what it was all about, and uh, the light went on, and I went, ah, oh, man, that's amazing. That's just amazing. But we were so irreverent about the whole damn thing that on in an Italian restaurant between the dress rehearsal on the day of the concert, prior to uh, the show itself, we, we went for a, a light meal at an Italian restaurant around the back of the Albert Hall. And John, bless him, looked at me and said, Ian, yeah, he said, by chance, he said, are you anywhere near finishing the lyrics for the second movement? <laughs> I said, oh, no, no, I don't. but I'll get on it now. <laughs> right before you're about to go on. So I wrote them on a napkin um, in the, in the uh, restaurant, which I ceremoniously put on the rostrum on the stage, this napkin that had the words written just half an hour earlier. It said that you were unhappy about the way Made in Japan ended up and that you disliked live albums in general. <laughs> I dislike live albums in general, yeah. Um, 
um, I wasn't unhappy with the way Made in Japan ended up. I thought it was amazing. It is. Um, it's a masterwork. I thought it was amazing. And one or two... See, here's what it is from where I'm standing. You do a show, and th this, is, this comes back from the old days, when w you had hardly any technical control over what the audience heard at all. PAs were crap. Sure. They were like, it was awful. You know, drum kits would fall to pieces in the middle of a show. Guitar amps would buzz and break down and crackle. And No, it was just a mess, totally. But you're, you got through it with attitude and skill. So you ignored all these things, and no one seemed to notice because everyone's having such a good time. So why dissect it and analyze it and listen to it from most people who weren't even there? Yeah. And so the whole, you're hearing everything except the atmosphere or the involvement. I've never heard the whole thing through. I've listened to sections of it at Roger's house. And uh, I, other times it's been played to me. But I have no interest in... It was a great night, as far as I recall. Uh, but I was tinged with sadness. Um, there, were, um, there were already rumblings of um, discontent within the band, you know. The Machine Head album. Uh, your initial recording location proved to be impractical, as nearby residents flooded the local police station's switchboard to complain about the noise that the band made. Although the police were prevented from entering the building by the band's roadies uh, who held the venue's door shut, the band was quickly evicted. I remember that that's lifted word for word from a, um, um, a PR statement or something at the time. Uh, oh, okay. I recognize the, the word. Was the PR statement accurate? Well, it was written by Claude Nobbs, Funky Claude in Smoke on the Water, who was the arranger oh. of the studio of the... Uh, he was a promoter uh, in Montreux, in Switzerland. And when the, uh, the guy fired the very pistol, the flare gun over my shoulder, of the place caught on fire pretty quickly. And it was Claude who went down and, um, into the basement to rescue the kids, dragging kids out the ground, you know. And so nobody died, um, although it's a miracle. And uh, the town council put out, um, or, or Claude himself, um, who's a figure of great authority in Montreux, put out the statement in conjunction with maybe the record label, I'm not sure. Okay. But um, I recognise the words from one of those sources, the label or from Claude Nobbs at the okay. time. Uh, but yes, um, it's true. Like Sabbath days. Uh, you were required to learn the band's old repertoire, but had difficulty remembering the words. So you eventually came up with a solution of writing the lyrics out on a Perspex folder and balancing it on a wedge monitor, turning the pages with your feet. It was on the floor, actually, not on a wedge monitor. Yeah. Okay. But, but turning the pages with your feet while playing? Well, yeah, it's easy. I just, you know, I'm sorry, but Iron Man just wouldn't sink in. <laughs> and um, I, I couldn't grasp it. I just, right. I, my head was... It's not tuned to this. Much different singing style to what you're accustomed it's not the, to. Yes, it wasn't the notes or the style. It was the, the actual words. I just thought, oh, oh I don't want to sing this. <laughs> so um, anyway, yeah, it was a bit um, unprofessional of me. But I, I, I had myself covered by this book, and I was able to turn the plastic sheets with the lyrics in. Or the, the prompts. They were prompts, basically. Well, I remember the day in Birmingham when uh, the at LSD, the Light and Sound uh, Productions, the guy said, anyone got any idea for a stage set? And Geezer Butler said, here's yeah, Stonehenge. And I said, great idea. He said, how do you visualise it? And he said, well, life size, of course. <laughs> so they made a life size. It wasn't actually, it was about two thirds scale, but it was still big enough. It was still too big. For it made out of years. carbon fibre or fibreglass and uh, anyway. So they had this dwarf dressed up as a baby, the devil's baby, crawling across the, the top to the sound of flange screaming. And at the final point, there had been a rehearsal prior to that. And at that point, what was supposed to happen was the dwarf falls off behind the drums onto a mattress. And the roadies come out dressed as druids, which is very effective, apart from the Reeboks you can see under their um, gowns, under their robes to a tolling bell, and then the dry ice, which they also didn't do at rehearsal, came flooding the stage. And this is my downfall, because first of all, um, the dwarf fell off the stage 
the druids came out, but the screaming hadn't stopped and it had taken on a lifelike texture because somebody had removed the mattress. <laughs> um, somebody in the band. And, um, That's great. and then, of course, I went to the front of the stage trying to keep a straight face and I was overwhelmed by this six foot cloud of dry ice. And I couldn't remember the first line of whatever the hell it so was. You see. I'm, I'm on my knees going like that. And then the, and then the floor lights came on and blinded me. <laughs> so I couldn't even see the book, let alone the words. So I'm popping up and down with a couple of words here and there. And yeah. It was just one of those magic moments. So you were largely dissatisfied with your brief stint in Sabbath, uh, notably the final mix of Born Again, although you liked the songs in their original mixes, and its cover which featured the demonic-looking baby. I thought that was great. No, that's been exaggerated. My only, my only, um, I was horrified by the mix. Right. And I, I can't be bothered when things go like that. And I thought, this is all that work. Yeah, I love the songs. I love the music. I love writing with Tony. I mean, I, we're still good buddies. And uh, we still write together occasionally. And, wow. Uh, so, um, uh, I, I took home some monitor mixes on a cassette in those days, which I still have, and it still sounds amazing. And then I heard the mix and the production for the first time. And all I could hear was like that. It was just somebody throwing a blanket. A blanket over the whole thing. And he'll deny it, but Geezer went to London to supervise a remix. Uh -huh. And that's what we ended up with. And uh, I think he might have had a slight bent towards the bottom end of the sound, you know, mm. being the bass player. Oh. The Now What album. Uh, the songs Uncommon Man and Above and Beyond, which includes the lyrics, Souls Having Touched Are Forever Entwined, are dedicated to founding member John Lord. Mm. That's true. Yeah. We heard about John passing away while we were making the album, and um, Ian Pace came in and said he's gone. We were expecting it. I mean, he'd been ill for a while. Um, nevertheless, it was still a shock. And um, for me, it's summed up by that line, souls having touched are forever entwined, which took me back to when my father died suddenly and I had to go and identify him in the morgue. And I felt this incredible inrush of my father's spirit into me. And he's been traveling with me ever since. And so have a lot of other people, according to our varying degrees of intimacy in life or the, uh, the effect that they've had on me. My uncle Ivo, who was a jazz pianist, has been traveling with me since uh, I was a teenager. And um, I, I think we're all like that. We get touched um, by people and they, they have an effect on us to varying degrees. And uh, so that's what happened with John. Instantly he invaded me. We had so many um, intimate moments on the tour bus traveling sharing discussions, philosophical debates. And for me, there's a mnemonic with John. He crops up in my life almost every single day. And it's the letter D. And because we used to share the cryptic crossword on, on the tour bus. Okay. And I used, we used to share the answer, working out the answers by talking through. But I was used to fill them in by writing the letters in. And, uh, he used to get grumpy with my letter D, the way I wrote the letter D. He said, well, that's not a D. I said, well, it looks like a D to me. Um, well, it doesn't look like it. It's confusing me. And he would always bitch and moan about this letter D. So every time I do my crossword, I go, hi, John. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and write it really nice for you. Uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. It says you personally invited Richie Blackmore to attend, but not to perform. That's not true. Fiction. Fiction. Invited, it was difficult. And I can understand everyone's point of view on this one. But we had to consider the living, breathing Deep Purple, yes. which has been, you know, Richie walked out on the band and we had to rebuild and we mm -hmm. carried on. And we, we had Steve Morse playing guitar for 20 years or more when this thing cropped up. The organization was so arrogant. They never asked a single thing. They were just, you know, saying, well, this is this and that. So I... And the other guys insisted that it had to be, if we were going to play anything, uh, the living, breathing Deep Purple. So you end up with a compromise, or you end up with the most reasonable thing you can do. So 
we thought, well, why don't we get, if we got, they wanted us to play three songs, so why don't we get Richie on to do Smoke on the Water? Yeah. And then we got Steve to play the other two and Richie to come on and do Smoke. And um, so I think Richie was offended at the time and very grumpy about the situation, the same as we were. Because obviously the parallax effect on reality. He was standing in a different position, so he saw everything differently. Sure. And so, yes, communications were sent. I know because I saw the email that went from my office, from my manager, not Deep Purple's manager, to Richie's manager, Carol. And it was a clear thing. Well, how about this for a solution? You know, how about Richie comes and plays smoke with us? And then, you know, hopefully we can keep everybody happy. And it'd be a pleasure. We'd love to do it. Yeah. That, those, that was the message that went across. Um, Richie says he never received that message, but... Um, Okay. So, you know, maybe people say things, I don't know. Or maybe there's a misremember at times. Well, Ian, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. And the it rest so of it much. is crap, by the way. I... About my family and my children and grandchildren and stuff non musical. Um, I've been told that um, the number of children I've got is ridiculous, and the number of grandchildren I've got and where they were raised and all that sort of thing. <laughs> It's a load of bollocks, but we're, we're dealing with music. I, I understand yeah, that. I don't okay. want to pull up all that stuff. I know, I know. Okay, but all right, mate. Thank you so much for your no, time. No worries. Infinite, the new Deep Purple record. <laughs>